Hi, this is Trista from Cooperatives First. The following webinar was recorded on October 28, 2021 on the topic of artisan co-ops. I was joined by Candice Klom, one of the founding members of the Ancestral Rich Treasures of Zuni Cooperative. I'm honored that Candice took the time to uh, tell us about the Arts Co-op story, including lessons learned and the benefits of working together and how the co-op structured itself to meet the needs of the members and to ensure that the artist receives a full market value of their work. We also discussed the different structures that members can take in forming their own co-op and how why a co-op may be the right choice for artisans to reach new markets. If you have any questions about this webinar or any of our upcoming webinars, contact me at tristacooperativesfirst.com. If you'd like to sign up for one of our upcoming sessions, please visit yourwaytogether.ca slash webinars. I hope to, you enjoyed this webinar. Thank you and until next time. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you for attending our Your Way Together webinar. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that I am sitting at the Cooperatives First head office, and we are based on the Treaty 6 territory, territory of the Cree, uh, Dakota, Dene, and homeland of the Métis. So I am Trista puapis -Gineas. I'm the Indigenous Relations Lead at Cooperatives First. And with me today uh, is Kyle White, our Governance and Education Lead. And uh, we're proud to have Candice Kwab from the Ancestral Rich Treasures of Zuni Cooperative joining us here today. Uh, so I'll just give a quick um, about the Ancestral Rich Treasures of Zuni Cooperative is a collective of proud Zuni artisans ranging from carvers, jewelers, metalsmiths, painters, potters, silversmiths, textile weavers, and woodworkers. They own and operate the arts gallery featuring artwork by cooperative membership. Uh, the gallery and administrative office is also a place by, used by community artists to strengthen the Zuni community, which empowered them to create the only Zuni artist owned and operated cooperative. Um, so I will start today's presentation uh, with just an overview of the co-op model, and then we'll go into, uh, we'll hear from Candice. Okay, uh, so these are, <laughs> today's presentation is on artisan cooperative models and Indigenous co-ops. So, Artisan co-ops, um, why do they exist? <laughs> is uh, co-ops are where uh, people work together to create uh, new businesses, share costs, labor, and access new markets. Um, they're created to meet the needs of members and the meet needs of consumers. So one of the oldest artisan co-ops in Canada is the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative that was established in 1959. Um, how the co-ops can actually meet the needs of consumers or the people who purchase it. Uh, this is actually a Facebook um, quote that I've seen. And throughout the pandemic, I've actually seen quite a few um, people reaching out on social media looking for large quantities of items. Uh, so this one is, I am looking for beaded earring curators out there. I'm looking to source 100 pairs by December 10th. I'm curious to see if this is feasible and was wanting to procure from several people. I may be crazy, but I'm putting together a limited edition of Raven Reed's Christmas box for the holidays. So this is somebody who's putting together these gift boxes and are looking for a large number of earrings. I've seen these for wanting large quantities of ribbon skirts or face masks. There's usually a need from consumers to get a large quantity. And as artisans uh, working together in a group and collaborating with other artists to fulfill these needs is so important to both uh, income generation and being able to, to provide um, these gifts to consumers. 
So uh, the co-op model, I'll kind of quickly go over that. What is a co-op? It is the, uh, it's based on one member, one vote. It's a very um, relationship focused, everybody has a say in how the co-op works. It is not based on how many people uh, put into the co-op, um, like how much capital people put into the uh, co-op. So for corporations, it's usually whoever invests the most gets the most say. In a co-op, it's one member, one vote. People are working together and they all get a vote in the direction of the co-op and how it's gonna be operated. It is very user focused. So it's meant to benefit the people who use it the most, receive the most benefits. Uh, if you're gonna sell most of your products to it, you'll get more back. Um, and the members are the owners. Uh, they don't have to be included in all operations of the co-op. Um, there's different structures you can use, but the members of the co-op are the owners. So where co-ops fit? Um, co-ops can fit anywhere where nations, independent producers or individuals see the opportunity of working together where everybody is not siloed, but people can collaborate on bigger business projects and create these opportunities, right? You can do it from the comfort of your own home, but just being able to work and creating these networks to get your products uh, either out the door or procure, like getting large quantities and um, being able to access supplies. Co-ops usually fit where big businesses and governments do not support and where people need to do this on their own. So it's working together for a cause and it benefits both the individuals and the community, uh, the co-op community that you're building with the other members. So some of the benefits of a co-op, um, it's collaborative, people are working together. Uh, owners have a voice, they can bring their, um, ideas and how they can work together and being able to, <laughs> to create an entity, uh, however they see fit. It is versatile. All artisan co-ops are not created the same. It's based on what the group uh, want to work and how they want to build it. Uh, the transparency. Um, there's been countless um, examples of people entrusting one person and, um, and not being able to have a voice or seeing where the benefits are going or where the money spent. This way, the members will be able to see and have the decision on where the resources would be best suited to go. Um, reaching new markets, uh, like I had mentioned before, uh, with for uh, larger consumers um, being able to uh, to meet them and sell their products through these um, places, there's been a growing number of gift shops and um, tourism hubs looking for authentic Indigenous goods uh, instead of purchasing them overseas. So being able to supply to gift shops in like tourism destinations is uh, a way to reach new markets. And it brings back uh, benefits back to the members. So some unintended benefits that I've heard from uh, artisan co-ops is safety. Um, <laughs> this is, where some co-ops, if they have a space away from their home, that they don't have strangers coming into their homes to procure goods, that there's a place that they could meet uh, customers. And it, it also like, so you don't have strangers coming into your homes for house like biddings and it also 
protects the customer as well as a place to meet. Uh, competition, uh, becoming allies, working together instead of everybody trying to bid on the same customer, being able to work together to fulfill orders. Uh, education, so learning new techniques off each other and also learning te <laughs> new techniques. Um, education could also be learning how the business works and the ins and outs of learning the new business. Um, so some artisan co-ops take on different structures, like I had mentioned before, and that's how co-ops can be versatile. Uh, supply co-ops are created when artists come together and want to do bulk purchasing, and that is a co-op. You have a group of people who just all you want to do is get supplies at a cheaper price, and you know that if you buy in bulk, you'll get a better deal. So there has been examples of uh, co-ops coming together to uh, purchase um, <clears throat> materials using a supply co-op. The second one is a worker cooperative. Uh, worker cooperatives uh, are usually found when individuals are coming together and working on one uh, project or item themselves. A good example of this is the Star Blanket Cooperative in Winnipeg, uh, where it start, uh, started with a group of women in a community center who uh, used to just sew together and it was more of a club and they decided that uh, working together on creating star blankets uh, would be the most beneficial. They get their star blankets out. They're still working together, collaborating. And in this situation, instead of getting a percentage of, um, or a, like a dividend back, they get a wage. Uh, so that's usually how the workers are their own bosses. So producer and marketing co-ops are, um, are, they can be used interchangeably. They're pretty much the same thing, worker or producer. Uh, but that is the producers coming together to sell their items through one place, so that, which may be a store. Um, we've also seen examples of multi-stakeholder co-ops. And a multi-stakeholder co-op is where you have uh, groups from the different structures that I have mentioned up here. Um, so you may have a group of producers who are creating items, and then you may have the gift shops who are buying the items from the producers. So you have people with different uh, visions and outcomes, but they're all working together for the supply chain. And that way the supply chain is guaranteed for, for all people. Um, so right now I would like to, um, that's the end of my presentation, uh, my little quick overview on a co-op. Um, and so I am super proud to have Candice uh, Quam from the Arts Co-op joining us and sharing their journey uh, of the, the how the co-op came to be and kind of uh, their lessons learned and how they're operating now. So thank you. And Candice. Okay, it's my turn. So, I guess I cut the now and the Candace Quam that you have a tatni day and get on chat. Hello, my name is Candace Quam. I'm here and live in Zuni Pueblo and giving you all the true res experience that we are accustomed to. My internet will not allow me to show my face, but I promise you, if you Google my name, you can see me right there. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> as I said, I am from Zuni Pueblo. I'm half Navajo and half Zuni, holding up that tradition of the half Navajo or full Navajo in the room. So that's me. So glad to be of service. <laughs> and let me share my screen so we can all see what arts is all about. So as I said, I'm from uh, arts or ancestral rich treasures of Zuni. We're based in Zuni Pueblo, which is in New Mexico or the greater Southwest. And just to give some context, 
hopefully you might know wants to work today. But yes, uh, we're right here in Zuni. Uh, and to give more context to where we are, we're fairly isolated in terms of where we are. We're about 45 minutes from the nearest town or the nearest Walmart or the nearest uh, grocery store, bigger grocery store, and about two and a half hours away from the biggest city, which is Albuquerque, New Mexico, and also the same distance from Flagstaff, Arizona. So we are fairly isolated in that fact that as isolated as we are, we also have a lot of uh, talent in arts. So we have silversmiths, carvers, sculptors, painters, textile weavers, we have everything that we could possibly get our hands on. That's to say, if you leave us with some random materials, um, 30 minutes of time, we'll end up making something. So, and just to get to the fact that we are isolated and there's not a lot of jobs here, of course, with the job market not being that well, and also having a lot of artistic talent, uh, art is very much the economy here. And it's, there's a, but I think there's a study a couple of years back where it's about 80% of households at least has one artist in their household. And just to give more context, I myself am an artist, my parents are artists and their grandparents are artists and so on and so forth. So that's just to say, just to paint the picture. And why we felt the need to have a cooperative is back in the 80s, uh, that's when around when Re uh, the former president Ronald Reagan came into power. When he, that happened, he laid a, a whole bunch of people off, and that affected our area very heavily. So we, everyone who got laid off, who were accustomed to having a paycheck biweekly, they had to switch gears and figure out what to do next. So they had a couple options. They can either go on to the next city, which is two and a half hours away, which who has a car to get to that place anyhow and who has the money to get there. Or you could just try and figure out how to do art. And that was the golden era of when a group of foreigners came past through. They had baskets, they had blankets, they had all these uh, sort of knickknacks you can find at a flea market. And since that was fairly new to us, since that's before time of the internet, we, and no one really had a lot of money at the time. So we decided to trade their wares for ours. So a beautiful silver bracelet would get so many baskets and blankets, which we would use for our ceremonies and that would kind of feed into everything religiously. And a couple trips through the village and they would get these really fine art, really beautiful artwork. They saw a market in that. So they began to buy these artwork from our artisans and they would sell it out to the greater market that created the job of the wholesaler or the jobber market. So that came into play. And that's when everybody started to really put all their chips into artistry. They started to really go full force in it. and that created the golden era of it because the demand for Native American art was very high to the point that we could barely keep up. And at first time maybe ever, to my knowledge, we had a real chance at the American dream. We could actually pay for food, really nice food for our to put on our family's tables. We could afford to fix our houses. We could afford to have a car, to do all these niceties that the like wider world was accustomed to. We had a first time to really uh, kind of indulge in that and to see what everything was about. So that was great. And if you talk to all the order artists about like that golden era of art, like, oh yeah, you could just see everybody with like four, like two or three cars outside their houses. Their houses were nice and whatnot. Like, oh, it was so nice. We would go to sell our stuff to a jobber and we would come back with, like we would go with them to them, like with $50 in my pocket. And I would come back with $3,000. It was so nice. And that's before inflation. That's when I think bread costs like, about 50 cents or so, now it's like two or three dollars. So that could really buy a lot of things here. So during that time, uh, capitalism, of course, kind of took over. And with the jobber market, they started to dictate our market where we didn't have power to say, I want fairly, if we're going by fair market value, a piece of artwork for fair for the artist and the wholesaler should be about 50%. So let's say retail a price would go like $200 and fair would be $100. But the jobber would say like 
uh, you know what, I'll buy it for $50 and I want 20 more by the end of the week. And if you can't do that, too bad keep walking because I have four other people who can do the same thing in quicker time. So that really created a hostility among us too because all these techniques that we had in terms of artwork, silversmithing and all these really precious techniques, we started to hoard them among ourselves. We were willing to teach each other that because if I teach you, you're gonna know exactly how I'm gonna do it and you're gonna take away food from my table and I need, to, I need that money for my family. And it didn't matter if it was somebody you really knew or if somebody from your younger, younger generation, you were uh, unwilling to share uh, these techniques and how to do the basic things. And that was very hostile. And even uh, it created a lot of competition to where like, well, if you sell it for that much, I have to make my prices even lower so I can make sure I can make a buck. And that was really hostile. And it's still kind of prevalent to this day. That's one of the things we address in the co-op. Um, but yeah, that's the reason why we needed, we felt the need for a co-op. And the ultimate event that led to the co-op was there is a program prior to arts that's called Zuni Pueblo Art Walk Program. And they were a tourist program, which they led tourists through the various artist studios. And they would go into the artist's home or their studios, and they would really get to see behind the scenes of making artwork. They would see their, their motors, their how they harvested their clay, how did they process their clay, everything that you could see behind the scenes um, before going to an art show or before going to sell their artwork. You could actually see the piece being created from the very beginning all the way to the finish. So that was a really great program. And another uh, entity came down called Cooperative Catalyst of New Mexico. This is another uh, cooperative development um, organization. They came down and they met with Art, Art Walk and they said like, what do you think is needed here in Zuni? What do you think is needed to thrive here? And they thought about like, wouldn't it be nice if we had a place, if we had a gallery, if we had a group that addressed um, and gave a fair platform for all the artists, whether they're emerging artists, veterans in the game, everybody had a fair playing field to where we could all kind of bring this uh, fair market to where it's fair for our, us as artists and also our customers. So, and Cooperative Callus more or less said, you know, it doesn't have to be, would it be nice? It can be reality. We can make it happen. All of us can do that together. And we just kind of ran with it. It was from the very beginning, like, wouldn't it be nice to that very first conversation to six months later, we were already in the gallery. Um, the initial meeting happened in February 2019. And we were incorporated April 2019 in the same year, which is, if you talk to anybody, crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. And we're, it's... If you ask me fine details of like the whole process, I don't really remember because it was a blur because it was all a mad dash of trying to get everything together. Another reason why we wanted the co-op is the business, business education to make sure everybody is on fair playing field and how to market their own stuff, how to talk to customers, how to price their stuff and how to engage in wholesale fairly. Also culture preservation is what I talked about before is just the meaning of designs, how, what, things go into making art, how the proper way to make art that's culturally relevant to us. That was one thing we wanted to do since uh, unfortunately capitalism kind of stopped that uh, sharing of knowledge between Hello, um, Candice, we um, are having a little bit of problems hearing you right now. Oh, no, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thanks. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Everything got really quiet, so I, I got worried. Okay. 
Okay, just to finish up, I'm not sure where it cut off, but uh, another need we needed for the co-op was culture, education, and preservation. Uh, unfortunately, with capitalism, all the sharing of knowledge, it being actual techniques or knowledge came to a close during the golden era. Also, we needed a Zuni-owned business for the village and just to keep that dollar in the village and to bring spread the wealth, so to speak. And as I said before, uh, incorporation happened at April 23rd, 2019, and we we're incorporated through the state of New Mexico. And if you ever come through Zuni, it's just one street. There's just one street that runs through the whole village. You cannot get lost unless you're going into like the subdivisions. There's no way you can get lost. <laughs> Actually, yeah, it's just like one road that goes through the village. And the gallery is right off the main road, so you can't miss it. It's just right across the, the gas station. And prior to that, it was a, a post office. After that, it was a gallery for a set amount of years, and it closed down in 2013, I want to say. But it's been closed for a number of years. And that's when you were talking about where to set up the gallery. That was our first place that we thought of because it was it's ready to to go and if you're going as a gallery it's perfect all the displays everything is there and it's just you just have to bring in the artwork and the people so we talked to the landlord of that particular building on the land and she said i have some other bidders that but they're all outsiders one was a coffee shop another one was a zumba studio another one was a gym like they're not saying they they're offering me these really uh outrageous price outrageous um down payment but I want a Zuni owner. I want I, I want our own people to occupy this building. So if you get in your your paperwork, if you get incorporated, all everything up to go, you'll be first priority. But you have to get it in right now. So we kind of scramble like, oh no, we have to get this done. So we talked to Cooperative Catalyst and we kind of gave them our situation. And they instead of saying like, no, we have to follow you know this sort of process, uh, the proper process that. Cooperative Catalyst or Cooperative Development does like, okay, we'll run with you. Like, okay, cool. So we went uh, really hard and we got incorporated. We got all our papers in. We even uh, applied for the business license for the tribe. And we got that all done before our soft opening, which was July of 2019. And that's about seven months, <laughs> or no, not even seven months. It was even less than that. And if you talk to anybody who's developed the cooperative, that's crazy <laughs> because it is. <laughs> and um, which is also another amazing fact is we did very well our first year as a cooperative. Uh, we were expecting, and also everybody we talked to about this, like we were expecting to have a turn of profit in about two to three years, and that's that's uh, that's appropriate in terms of business. But we turned a profit on our first year, which was outstanding, and it was done with no advertising at all. When we first opened our yeah, when we first opened in July of 2019, we didn't even have a Facebook page, much less a Facebook post. <laughs> so it was amazing, and our roster, our initial roster of artists, we are very fortunate that most of us have a fairly big clientele. So we just kind of through the word of mouth through our clientele and through their friends, we got to bring all sorts of people to the gallery and also the village at large. And that's what created a great profit for the gallery and our artists. And just some nitty gritty, nitty -gritty detail, the income for that first year was 20,000 so dollars, artist payout was 12,000 so dollars. Uh, I'll say the exact amount because I always end up saying that wrong. So, and the reporting, we do file taxes, uh, federal C corporation tax in New Mexico. We also pay taxes to the state of New Mexico and also the tribe as well. Okay, and here is our board. There's actually some of us right there. The guy at right at the computer is our president, Keith e. Daki. He's a well known muralist and painter. He if you find him somewhere, he's always painting something or he's always running around. <laughs> so he's always around. And uh, right next to him is Carlton Hamon. He's a well-known silversmith, uh, metalsmith. If he's one of the truly, if you leave him alone with like any sort of material for about 30 minutes to an hour, there's gonna be something made. <laughs> there's some sort of art to be made. And he has all these sorts of businesses. And I would go far as to say he's the father of contemporary Zuni jewelry. 
and their secretary, that is myself. I am a, I was gonna say silversmith, but I'm not that, um, a painter. I've done some murals. I'll, I'm also one of the ones, if, if I don't know an art form, I will know it at some point. So just give me some time. And our treasurer, Pamela Lasselin, is a silversmith. Uh, she's actually pretty amazing. She, in terms of the other silversmiths, she's fairly new, but her talent is very amazing. Jeff Shatima, he's a silversmith and a well-known fetish carver, which is to say he's a sculptor. One of the things that Zuni is known for is carving, so and he's also very talented in that. Uh, Elroy Nadachu Jr., he's also a painter and he he's a master or beginning master of Pueblo textiles. So he knows how to weave and every all the traditional techniques that our people are known for. And Galen Westica, he's a potter. He comes from a well-known pottery family. So we're kind of all in the arts. So that's our board. So we're of Zuni artists and we're for the Zuni artists. And anybody who is an artist here or works with artists, uh, you know that paperwork is the natural enemy to the artist. So we as a board act as the people who hate paperwork the least. So we help take a, take a care of all the nitty gritty details that our artists don't want to deal with. <laughs> and our membership boils down to 33 members, uh, 12 female and 22 male. We do have a husband and wife duo, so they do count as one membership. And as just stated before, we are one membership, one vote. And that also counts as the couple who uh, applied together. So even though they're two people, they did apply for one membership. So they're, they're one member, one vote. In terms of our documents, we have bylaws, membership agreement, and consignment agreement. And at the end of the year, we give everybody a 1099 for their taxes. Our membership requirements is just this. One requirement is you have to be enrolled in the, as a Pueblo Zuni. So that's the only requirement we really have. And we, prior to this, we had volunteer requirements for each member. They would have to volunteer at the gallery for two shifts per cycle. That was before. So now we just implemented a new thing uh, between the board and the membership to where if they wanted if they're not comfortable with um, handling the gallery and handling, handling customers, they can do other things. They can do uh, gallery maintenance, uh, cleaning the gallery out, or going outside as uh, land maintenance. They can take care of the leaves. They can do what they want to. And we also have these monthly projects to do and like reinstalling the stove for winter time, helping uh, get the ducks in the basement all ready for, the upcoming seasons, they can do, we have a kind of a laundry list of things they, they can volunteer for, and that'll uh, count as their membership requirements for per member. And if they happen to be outside the village, they can do some website work, they can post on social media, and that'll count towards their membership requirements or their volunteer requirements, I should say. Also, we have consignment, this is our consignment fee breakdown. A uh, general membership is a 60-40 split. 60 will go to the member and 40 will go to the gallery just as an overhead just to keep our doors open. And furthermore, if a member wants to go uh, take on more responsibility, they can become a gallery manager, manager and in trade of their hard work, we give them a lower consignment. So 75 will go to that manager and 25 will go to the gallery. But with this new uh, membership or volunteer to do this or responsibilities, we just implemented that a general member will get 70 30 and the gallery manager will get uh, 75 25. And we're just all about the artists. That's the main thing that we're here for. Yeah, um, that's my presentation. And I for the thing I forgot to mention is. Uh, another thing that we address in the co-op is authenticity, because during that golden era, when the demand for art was so high, us as artists couldn't keep up. So wholesalers and other outsiders decided to make these. Everything went quiet. 
Okay, okay, cool. Um, yeah, uh, they decided to make these small cities in foreign countries like China, the Philippines, and other, there was another place that I don't remember, Indonesia. There is another place in Indonesia that they would call these little villages Zuni and they would produce all of these artwork and they would just get made in Zuni. And that's totally counterfeit. Everything was, and you can tell, you can tell what's counterfeit and what's not, or some of them are pretty good. And we, in our property, we have, with every item, we have a little tag of authenticity and we have a sign, uh, sign from the artist, as well as their own personal trademark on the pieces. So we do educate our customers on that too, because also ultimately we are for the artists and our customers. There have been instances in the past where a customer come in with a piece of jewelry or artwork, what have you, and they'll say like, my grandparents bought this in so far back and they gave it to my parents and now my parents gave it to me. Can you tell me how much this is worth? And we'll look at it like, ah, this, this is fake. I'm so sorry, but this is fake. This isn't worth anything. And it's just heartbreaking to see that sort of scene play out. So we just really try to address that issue of authenticity. But thank you for letting me ramble on for so long. If you have any questions for me, please let me know. So um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, like, well, first I should really thank you, Candice. Um, it was a great presentation. Um, I'm fortunate enough to hear uh, this presentation prior and to hear Candice speak and just inspired. And uh, I really wanted to use this Your Way Together webinar series to bring these inspirational stories. So. Um, so I am truly honored to have you come and speak to, to us here today. Um, so I'd like to open it up for any questions uh, for Candace. Hi, Candace. <clears throat> um, I'm Lisa from Winnipeg, Canada, in the in the kind of the, the center of the country anyway so um i have a question about how do you manage when i think about co-ops i think that <clears throat> a really big challenge is uh getting consensus on decisions and you know we're i guess one of the other things too i see is that is that sometimes in co-ops people there'll be like a either a core group of people who are doing the majority of the work or there's maybe even just one person who's doing that. So how do you guys manage the like your your group decision making and conflict resolution? That's a really good question. Actually, we were just talking about this not too long ago, but since we're a a smaller village or we are a smaller tribe um, we have the luxury of knowing each other before before we came to the co-op. So we play on each other's strengths. So the board, we have a lot of organization skills and kind of like the overall uh, back office skills that we have each individually. And everybody has their own strengths in the co-op. Like uh, certain members of our co-op, let's just say for an example, they don't like to talk to customers or they don't like presenting themselves in customers, but they're really strong in, uh, just cleaning up the gallery, be it inside or outside, so they get to do that if we want, if they want to, and we just kind of play up on everybody's strengths. And we do have the fortunate uh, part of everybody knowing each other. So, and the cultural background of let's work together, let's do this together, because we're stronger together than we are apart. One heart, one mind type of mentality. So that's the thing that always brings us back is we're not here for ourselves, we're here, well, we are here for ourselves, but ultimately we're here to work together as a group to get things done and to make sure this is a overall positive experience for our people and everyone else at large. But we have butt heads before, yeah, but we, <laughs> I think that's pretty inevitable, <laughs> especially among us artists, we're kind of like a, a an interesting, interesting 
group of people, <laughs> to say the least. And just per personalities tend to butt heads, but overall, we kind of get over it and we move forward. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Oh, can I ask you another question? What is what did you mean by I've never heard that term jobber? Can you just describe what that is? Well, it's just like people who come through and and buy a bunch of like they'll they'll just buy a bunch of stuff from artists. They're just sort of like individual people who will come come through. Is that who they are? Yeah, basically. So they're just wholesalers. It's what we call them. Uh, more often than not, if you just drive through the village, you'll see a truck or a vehicle uh, parked outside and there'll be a long line of people. Those people are artists who are wholesaling their artwork to that jobber or wholesaler. So that's just kind of slang for a wholesaler. So and they'll be out there like whether it's 100 degrees or like 20 degrees or like scolding really hot uh, I just forgot we were talking about, uh, I was talking to you Canadians and you guys are way more sophisticated with this, <laughs> with the uh, terms of uh, degrees and Celsius. So, but it'll be like in the middle of summer in the Southwest or like really deep into winter, they'll be outside. And it doesn't matter if it's like early morning or late at night, they'll be out there with like a whole line of people. So we just offer that space to, we'll even invite these wholesalers to come into our gallery just so everybody's in a respectable selling place. So nobody feels that weird power, power dynamic. So, mm. and it's safer too. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. I have a question. Um, this is Fern. Hello. Um, so with the pandemic happening, um, a lot of businesses like physical brick and mortar businesses, they've actually shut their doors and went online. Has that affected your business model as well for your gallery? Has, have you seen any kind of like, uh, I guess, less people coming in, less sales in person? Oh, yeah. I actually forgot to bring that up in my yeah. presentation. You're totally right. So as I said before, we actually got incorporated and our first year was right before the pandemic and that's when we had our we had all our ducks in a row for that year so we had so many programs you're going to do this and that and then the pandemic came through mm -hmm. and our community was really <clears throat> affected by that so for the safety of everybody and plus our tribe was closed down at the time too to outsiders we closed down our doors to our physical location it's still open and we still go there and mm -hmm. we still pay rent to that space towards the gallery but that really pushed us to having online or a website and all these online initiatives like an auction and all these different initiatives that we had just to keep uh, money flowing to our artists because that's almost ultimately who we're for is our fellow artists. So we are very mm -hmm. fortunate during that time too to have a very generous donation uh, from a very wealthy donor. So instead mm -hmm. of kind of hoarding that money and keeping the gallery open, we gave that to our artist. So a okay. good person of the artists or our artists got a good portion of that money. And what was left over, we gave to our community. So ultimately we're here for our people. So that's what we were concerned about and still concerned about to this day. Um, are you getting any pushback for reopening and having to recharge the, like the rent on the building that you're, you kind of gave them back before or? Is that? Oh no, we all have this understanding like we're in this yeah. together. So yeah, okay. Once it was safe enough, we opened and we really had a lot of discussion about it yeah. between the board and the members whether or not this was safe, and everybody everybody was full steam ahead for opening up again. Right. Um, and then I had another question about the demographics of your cooperative. Like, do you have a median age that um, of your artisans and? Does that affect, do you notice that there's a no capacity as far as business? Um, as you had mentioned that they don't like talking face, like most artists are like that, right? They're very, um, they're creators. Um, I like to create bead work myself and stuff. And I usually get into a mode where I like sit there for hours and kind of shut the world out. And I'm kind of the same way sometimes too. So do you find that the age of your group affects business relations um with the with the public that's a good question um 
not often. Most of uh, the elderly in our cooperative are veterans in the game. So they're, what I mean veterans is they've been creating art and going to art shows. Majority of them are art show artists, meaning they travel the country around and go to art shows prior to the pandemic. Is it that what they would do? Actually, if you come to any of the art shows, the bigger art shows in the US, there's always going to be a Zuni there. Nine out of 10, there's always going to be a Zuni. <laughs> so we're always going to be there. And it's, uh, they're more than likely going to be there. And if you ask them about their art show stories, they'll, they'll say, <laughs> get ready, get comfortable, because you're going to be there for a while, right. more or less. So more, more of them know how to talk to customers and like to. But we do offer an option for the elderly. If they don't want, if they're physically unable to volunteer, they have the option to have a, another family member volunteer for them. And if that family yeah. member doesn't want to talk to customers, they can volunteer for another to-do list for the co-op. Like they can uh, clean up outside, get the outside nice for customers. They can get the stove ready. They can do other things, these manual labor sort of things. So they have that option. OK, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Candice or, um, or myself? <laughs> uh, so, uh, oh, I see that Carrie has a question. Uh, Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you, Candice. I was just wondering if uh, uh, our staff in this co-op quite recently is a consultant to us. She was complaining about how cooperatives work together. And if it just opens up uh, new opportunities or networking chances for the artisan collective with some other cooperatives or new connections of any kind. Oh, yeah, there's been all sorts of uh, sharing of knowledge between other cooperatives, too, which is really great uh, because we're just kind of grinding on our own and we're just it feels like sometimes it gets kind of lonely in terms of like well we're the only ones doing this it feels and but these sort of spaces like this webinar gives space to share ideas which is really great and we can share ideas between each other give each other pointers and that's really great so even though it feels lonely sometimes when you look up you see some other people running around you doing the same thing which is phenomenal and just to give another fun fact, I always forget about this, but in New Mexico, the state of New Mexico, we're the only indigenous native or indigenous artist owned cooperative in New Mexico. So that's a fun fact I like to throw. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention is the sharing of knowledge. So as I mentioned before, artists prior to the cooperative, and if you ask all the other members too, if somebody, especially if there's any, ask you, like, how do you do this? How do you, and you just kind of get to stiffen up. It's a real quick way to make things awkward. So, because we'll not answer you. Even if you ask me, like, how do you paint a butterfly? Like, uh, you paint it good just go on Google, like, just go on Google, just YouTube it, it'll be fine. And I won't say anything about how I do it, I'll be very vague. But after the co-op and once we got into it, and to give an example, I was working, me and my cousin who I'm in business with prior to the co-op, we were working on uh, something at the co-op and another artist, two artists came by and they were watching us, and they were passing through. Like, hey, I noticed you're working on that. And I know a better technique. I know this better technique that's faster and less expensive. Come to my come to my workshop. I'll show you. You can use all my materials until you get the hang of it. Like, okay, cool. And prior to that, if that was unheard of before. And we went to their workshop and the techniques they taught us was amazing. Like, wow, wow, this is really cool. Like, oh, we've been doing it the dumb way all these years. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just all of a sudden we were the only ones who did that. There's many other artists. The wealth of information that is spread is really amazing. It's fun to see. Plus, we try to start to treat each other like family too, to the point where like if somebody makes, if I make a sale, I'm pretty happy. That's cool. But if another member makes a sale, like I'm so happy for them. I feel like like yes, you did it. <laughs> I'm way more happy for them than I am for myself. So that's another cool unintended benefit of a cooperative. 
Uh, do we have any other questions or comments? I have a question. I'm just wondering, how do you, um, how are you able to keep a quantity of things on hand? Like, so I was taking a look at your website and you have, you have things up there. I'm wondering, you know, like here in Manitoba, I see that, uh, like there, there isn't a steady flow of like, you can't go to a shop here that sells, um, you know, that buys on commission from artists. They don't have, places don't have a steady flow of something like you can't say, oh, I remember I bought this a year ago and I'd like to buy it as a gift again. Like there isn't a steady flow of things. So when you have a website and you have, you know, you have a picture showing up there, how are you able to keep a steady flow of, of certain items, let's say? Is that hard to do? Like, do you have, you know, like sometimes maybe an artist isn't, isn't working that month, for instance? Like, how are you able to do that? That's a really good question. Um, we have the luxury of most people bringing in artwork pretty consistently. Even on the website, that's not our full inventory. We're in the middle of creating another website. So we're putting all the newer items on there. So we're very fortunate that us artists can't keep still. So somebody's always making something. <laughs> so there, there's some artists who will bring 20 pieces at a time and they'll come like once or twice a month. So that's, the gallery is pretty stocked. And once you tell them like, hey, you only have two pieces, like, oh, I'll bring, I'll bring some more pieces and they'll come in. It's actually the only thing that takes the longest time is logging in everything <laughs> into inventory. So. Uh, but we do have to poke our artists That's every awesome. time. Yeah, thank you. But so we do, do you, have to poke you don't have artists. a yeah, you don't have a problem then with people. I mean, one of the problems about doing this kind of work, especially like you're working towards a show, let's say, or to stock a gallery, is that you know there's so much work and time you have to put in before you actually sell an item. So there isn't a problem then with people having enough supplies and just living money ahead of time to be able to make that? Or do you have a, is there a way that you're able to pay artists during the time when they're making the stuff and instead of just selling it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I totally get you. Um, but yeah, we, that's an interesting part that we all often run in before these bigger shows is most of us are in those shows and there's a handful of them that, that don't normally go to the show. So they'll normally take the helm when it comes to running the gallery. But in terms of paying our artists, uh, we normally try to schedule our artist payouts right before, like a week before the actual show so they can have some spending money. So that's what we try to center around our, our artist payouts. But since the pandemic, we haven't been doing that <laughs> as often. So, but yeah, that's, a, that's an issue that we often run into. And unfortunately, most of us do go to the show. So everything is extremely hectic about the week before, <laughs> like days yeah. before. So yeah. Yeah. And then all of your money goes into buying silver or and all of your time too. So, so you can't, there's no money flowing like oftentimes when you work like that, right? There'll be months and months and months where there's no money coming in, but you need to be spending money to buy supplies and stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. And we do have, uh, well, most of us do have the luxury of having other buyers. So we're always kind of, in our village, we just kind of like, the more art you make, the more that you advertise yourself. And we do help with that too. If an artist wants to take really quality pictures of their work we do have the photo equipment that they will that mm. the house that we have a camera we have a, a shadow box we have all these different things that they could use to help market themselves okay thank you very much yeah no problem oh and janelle just saw your question we do have some performers actually we have i'm not sure if anyone knows of shelly morning song and fabian um Silicion, but we do have them. They're a singer dancer duo. We also have a lot of uh, dance groups here, uh, traditional dance groups. Uh, how would you say that? It's 
the social dance that they normally go out to, and we're pretty famous for that too, is different dance groups will go out to like the Indian Public Cultural Center in the bigger city and they'll dance and they'll have all these sorts of uh, engagements with the bigger public. So we do have that, but they're not part of the co-op right now. We're still trying to kind of get our bearings, especially with the pandemic at large still. Oh, and to clarify, her question was, in your territory, are there any indigenous performer collectives? Oh, as of collectives, uh, we don't have any uh, formal collectives. It's more so family-based. So if a family has a really well-known, uh, well, here we, sh I should just name them out. Uh, there's a family called the Silucion family, and they're known for their dances. They're actually known worldwide for their songs and for their dances. So they'll go even to Italy and they'll perform. So that's their own, that's kind of informal collective, I suppose. <laughs> 